Hello, role-playing people, and in this episode, and quite a few following episodes, we're going to take a look at the often unseen aspects of Sabbat culture, and why this sect isn't just made up of psychotic, inhumane idiots who run around like gremlins, sticking their fingers into electrical sockets until they turn to ash. This episode and any follow-ups on the same topic are made at the suggestion of Dominus Diabolic. Greetings, Dominus, and thank you for the wonderful idea. The Sabbat are probably my favorite sect due to their wealth of practices and rituals, as well as the very turbulent history they have endured mm, somewhat successfully all the way into the modern nights until the fourth Sabbat civil war. With it being my favorite sect, my own opinions, though informed, are somewhat biased. And it needs to be said right from the start, I will be referring to Sabbat culture and society as it was after the third Sabbat civil war in 1957. That's my favorite period in their history because at this time the clanless, aka the panders, gain official recognition, to be officially thrown under the bus if nothing else, the main factions are fully formed and the official law is still the revised code of Milan whether some of them like it or not, given the traction it gained after the Purchase Pact of 1803, at the end of the first Sabbat Civil War, and the revisions or additions made to this code in 1933, at the conclusion of the second Sabbat Civil War. The Inquisition receives its new Grand Inquisitor in 1973, since the temptation and danger of diabolism are ever-present, the Tremere Anti-Tribu are still around till 1998, the silence of the blood, or otherwise the need for secrecy and discretion, is becoming more and more relevant, and the Ritus are still very much observed being an essential part of Sabbat culture and unlife. And yes, I will refer to what the books call Rite as Ritus, because this is a eudeclension or a fourth declension a uh, masculine Latin noun, which means rite or ceremony, and the plural form is exactly like the singular form in the nominative case, so ritus is the correct form, not rite. I want to take this opportunity to thank Anarch Drac, who helped collect and correct these linguistic inaccuracies found throughout the books, there's quite a few of them, and uh, thanks to him I can use the correct names of these rituals which I will share with you in this episode and the following. Certainly, Vampire is a game, and it is fiction, but that is no excuse for blatant bad grammar, mistranslation, or made-up versions of real-life foreign words, since using the real terms correctly is so much better, it's more authentic and immersive. I am looking not only to collect the lore, but to explain certain practices from the perspective of the game's internal logic, and also to present listeners with a Sabbat that works, that is culturally rich and fun to play like I know it can be, offering a wider range of story options. Which is ironic, really, because late V20 edition effectively presents the failure and the rupture of the Sabbat after their uh, Fourth Civil War. Meh. Considering the period I'm going to talk about, between the 60s and the 2000s, that hasn't happened yet and the sect has a lot of potential. Another disclaimer, last one, I promise. Throughout this journey I will be predominantly making use of books such as Guide to the Sabbat, 1999, and Rites of the Blood, 2014, though, of course, we can find relevant information in the core book, the V20 Companion, 2012, the slightly dated By Night books that deal with Sabbat cities, Montreal By Night, 1997, and Mexico City By Night, 2002, as well as Kane's Chosen, 2003, and, of course, The Book of Nod. 1993. For now, I want to start off with some opinions I've collected from Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. Here we go. Oh, it's a Sabbat raid. The Sabbat, they're, uh, oh, Christ, I was hoping to spare you this shit till later. Uh, the Sabbat, well, uh, they're mostly mindless, bloodthirsty assholes. That's all you need to know for now, all right? 
Sabat might be mindless, but they hit like a Mack truck, like raging savages. Nothing a fledgling like he wants to mess with. The Sabat. A pack of shovelheads with cheap pistols was all they could muster. Diablerists. The Sabat's infamy is in no small part due to their practice of diablerie. That is, drinking the blood of other kindred. Especially older ones. Until they are dead. Diablerists gain the power of those they've fed upon. And the Camarilla, this is an act punishable by death. The Sabat's goal is to stop Gehenna, which is very similar to my own, though they choose to do so through more violent, fanatic, and flamboyant methods. The Camarilla, on the other hand, suspends belief entirely. Or so goes the party line. The Sabat are worthless, man. Fake tits on a zombie worthless. Fun to watch, though. Like the Three Stooges with chainsaws. Yeah, they oppose the Camarilla, but they suck when it comes to execution. The Sabat are in the same business as the Camarilla. Sabat have a little longer chain, but they're slaves all the same. You ask me, the Sabat makes no sense. They couldn't care less about the masquerade, and they seem to care even less about themselves. It's like, hey, let's all spread hell on Earth so we can feel big and bad. Oops, I'm dead. Now how did that happen? Okay, what we've just heard is a description of the most commonly observed face of the Sabbat. This is what the other sects see. But they should look very carefully because this is a highly superficial and dangerously misinformed way of looking at the Sabbat. There is a good reason why the Sword of Cain has been the main antagonist of the Camarilla since the Convention of Thorns 1493 and all the way into the Final Nights. Despite their undoubtedly inhuman practices, which we will get into in a little while, this sect has, or has had, members such as Ekaterina the Wise, the Agitator of Prague and Promethean Bruja, Vasanta Sena, arguably the greatest seer of the sect who values maintaining humanity and is a longtime critic of paths of enlightenment. Cardinal Kyle Strathcona, who was once Prince of Montreal and he betrayed the Camarilla and joined the Sword of Cain, only to find himself increasingly dissatisfied with the disunity of the Sabbat, pondering a new betrayal. These are not stupid, incapable vampires by any means. Who else? Let's see here. Sasha Vikos, who captured Victoria Ash herself during the Siege of Atlanta, 1999. Radu Bistri, the wandering cardinal who was once a member of the Council of Ashes in the 12th century. And, well, a lot of old world Zemitsi and La Sombra. Uh, these are vampires with a history of ruling and keeping themselves in power against mortal and supernatural threats alike. From the La Sombra side, it is worth noting Galeazzo, the former Archbishop of Milan, who had deals with both the surrounding Camarilla and the Giovanni, keeping all of these competitors at bay, keeping Milan a Sabbat city all the way into the 20th century, when he got completely fed up with the Sabbat's antics, burned the original copy of the Code of Milan before his brothers and sisters, surrendered them to the flames of his burning mansion, killing all of them, and defected to the Camarilla, gaining the full support of a cater of Archons. My point is, the Sabbat has many, many faces, almost as many as it has cardinals, archbishops, and factions. It is not a sect incapable of learning from past mistakes, though obviously it learns very slowly and needs to be careful of how it enforces its laws, lest it violates the foundational principles or, on the other hand, uh, loses valuable members. It is not so disorganized that it can't plan successful conquests, taking down princes and entire Camarilla cities like it did during the fire dance of 1999. It is a sect that some vampires joined willingly, while some defected from it, but the fact that deserter archbishops of the Sabbat managed to integrate into Camarilla society without much effort, despite their practice of paths of enlightenment, should already show you that the Sabbat isn't just a bunch of idiots kept together through extensive use of communal blood bonds. 
There are highly intelligent, refined manipulators among them, diplomats, nobles, scholars, shot callers, who know when to draw the line and when certain attitudes become too much and put everyone at risk. Uh, because these Cainites have been keeping themselves in power in the old world for centuries. They might not respect the masquerade, but some of these elders were around during the time of the Inquisition. They were fledglings or neonates at that time. So they know just how dangerous even ordinary humans can be, though the Sabbat considers mortals, the children of Seth, as they are called in the Book of Nod, inferior to Cainites, who are, of course, the children of Cain. The Sabbat are very much capable of secrecy and discretion, because their survival and the success of their operations depend on these skills, especially when it comes to members of the Black Hand. I, I know the Latin name of the Black Hand is used to refer to the Talmahera, the true Black Hand, and not the Sabbat faction, but it's a good time to mention the correct form is Manus Nigra, because Manus is one of the rare fourth declension feminine nouns and Nigrum is the neuter form, not the feminine form. So, Manus Nigra is the correct version. Okay, back to the Sabbat. Had they made no use of obfuscation or misdirection throughout the centuries, playing the Jihad with their cards in the open, they would have been easy targets not only for mortal hunters or the agents of the Camarilla, but for other supernaturals as well. It is highly unlikely that the sect would still be around based solely on brute fighting force, mass embraces, and random gratuitous uses of the gifts of Cain. Because during the day, like all other vampires, the brothers and sisters of the Sword of Cain are in a state akin to torpor, and they can barely function in that state. Any mortal hunter, Camarilla agent, mage, technocrat, werewolf, or anyone who has even a basic understanding of vampire lore can mop the floor with them. So the Sabbat fully revel in their inhuman predatory nature, that's for sure, but they can't afford to be stupid. If they're stupid, they get ashed. Some weaknesses, like their uh, fear of fire, can be circumvented to some degree, which is where the practice of the fire dance comes in but others cannot and should be acknowledged as such. During daylight hours, the might of the Sabbat is greatly diminished to non-existent. Even the animal kingdom acknowledges the importance of stealth and careful observation of a target. The humble house cat knows you don't leave your poop lying around all over your hunting ground because it's going to alert your prey to your presence so you bury it instead. Even foxes noticed when hedgehogs curl into balls of spikes, a go-to defense mechanism, you can roll them into a body of water and drown them. What is the point of these examples, you're probably thinking? The point is careful observation, stealth, cunning, patience, and the ability to learn are traits even animals possess. Creatures who have never had a notion of humanity as a path of morality. So, this idea that the Sabbat are a bunch of brainwashed idiots who murder everything in their way with no self-restraint makes zero sense to me. Especially given that certain moral paths currently practiced by their members forbid the senseless killing of mortals. On the matter of uh, using disciplines openly, again, the Sabbat couldn't care less about the masquerade but they would care about being observed by potential enemies, external or internal, um, about giving away information that can be used against them, especially given how much conflict there is within the sect itself. In the Jihad, one of the most useful things you can do is to deceive and misdirect, without letting anyone find out your weakness or your forte, because the moment someone is aware of what weapons you can use against them, they can prepare a defense and, of course, a counterattack. The wiser, more experienced members of the sect know that pretending to uh, still be human 
rejecting your undead nature and trying to blend into mortal society is one thing that is the masquerade and has no place in Sabbat society. But being a sloppy ambush predator who constantly relies on very indiscreet uses of the gifts of Cain just because you have them isn't exactly a celebration of your undead nature either. I hope you will agree, it's just a lack of hunting skill. It's, it's the mark of a weak hunter. And that is exactly the type of weak vampire that the Sword of Cain detests. So, in this initial incursion into all things Sabbat, I guess the first thing to look at is how did the other sects arrive to this conclusion that the Sword of Cain is made up of frenzied, irrational beasts? And the answer to that is shovelheads, of course. Most members of the other sects interact with the Sabbat only through shovelheads, who are embraced on the fly, en masse, only to be terrified or otherwise commanded into doing whatever their sires need doing, whether it's uh, starting fires, feeding at random, breaking the masquerade, murdering left and right, and so on, something that will probably lead to their deaths. Okay, and this is, this is only the first night following their embrace. I can't even begin to imagine the desperation and terror these poor people feel as they're forced to raise hell on Camarilla domains, most of them not even knowing they are now vampires. So it's only normal they would fall prey to Frenzy or Rothschreck, which would result in the mindlessness and ferocity so often observed by members of the other sects. Now, a tricky question. Is the Sabbat actually counting on these miserable wretches to take over a city or take out important Camarilla members? That's what uh, a lot of other kindred seem to assume, falsely, of course, because the answer is no. Shovelheads are almost never embraced within a Sabbat city, unless it's for a very good reason. Instead, they are a tactical weapon, a tool of misdirection that nomadic packs deploy in other cities before sieges or raids um, to uh, raise the heat, to provide cover, to force a wrong move out of your enemy, uh, or to otherwise uh, map out the members of a Camarilla city, their reactions, havens, response times, and resources. Certainly, utilizing this weapon inefficiently will do nothing but to give away your position and put the Camarilla on alert. But a correct and efficient usage of shovelheads can yield the following results. 1. Misdirection. Deploy shovelheads in a completely different part of the city than the one you're nesting in and force the Camarilla to spend and deploy resources over there. The more resources you force them to spend on this, the better. If your pack is already stealthy enough and don't feel the need to use shovel heads as a cover, well, then you can use them as... Number two, bait. Deploy them nearby and use all available gifts of Cain to hide and stalk from the shadows. You never know which piece of information will lead to a successful siege later on. Anything from reaction times uh, to the types of resources the Camarilla uses to clean up and cover up your, your attack, anything that gives away a little more information is good. Who shows up on the scene? Where did they come from and what were they driving? What were they equipped or armed with? How shaken were they? Police? Fire department? Private task force of special trained Camarilla ghouls? What were they? This is the kind of information that is going to prevent your pack from going in blind and getting ashed. In the ideal scenario, if you manage to strike uh, around one of the Elysia of a city with your feral shovel heads, frightened fledglings and neonates might fly into a panic and make very visible moves which put them in a vulnerable position, allowing you to stalk them and find out where their haven is, or capture them and squeeze them for juicy information. But if none of this is on the menu because you're just passing through the city, number three, raiding and hell raising. Maybe your intention isn't to nest in said Camarilla city, 
but just to pass through as quickly as possible, maybe in a single night. There's no reason why you can't raise a little hell just to give them something to deal with, hopefully draining some more of their resources in the process and frightening their mortal herd. I mean, there's only so many favors and cover-ups mortal allies of the Camarilla can pull before they make mistakes that can't be covered up and lose their positions of power. Your shovelheads might just be the straw that breaks the camel's back, but you'll never know unless you try. When it comes to raiding, if your pack has the proper transportation for this, there is no good reason why you wouldn't kidnap mortals from a Camarilla domain and take them back to your own city to be used as sacrifices during a blood feast. More honor to your pack. That being said, uh, no one expects you to take over cities using shovelheads alone. And uh, even in Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, which is an amazing game, even though it occasionally feels like a parody of the tabletop game, what happens is actually very smart. Shovelheads strike the prince's courtroom, and in the meantime, they take over a warehouse. In the meantime, Zimitsi Andrei can make a nice little haven in the Hollywood Hills, while the, the main Sabat force takes over the Hollowbrook Hotel downtown. Then, the main force lays low while Andre starts flooding the sewers with flesh monsters, again, misdirection. And when all eyes are pointed towards Hollywood, bam, they strike the Venture Tower. Even though the attack is unsuccessful, it's still precise. I mean, they knew exactly where the Prince of the City makes office. So, the Sabbat are definitely nowhere near as stupid as they seem. Another common misconception is that mass embraces are the only way packs embrace their new members. But that one is to be addressed in the next Sabbat episode. Thank you very much for listening, take care, have fun, and always observe the Ritus.